Let's, let's jump into our last portion today, and I was talking to the kids uh, just this morning, and I was thinking, for those of you that know me, I'm a, I love the Middle Ages time period, I love the movies, I love the history, I, I dive in I just this last week, and I have a problem with, with rabbit holes, and I don't know if it's ADHD or what, but, but I, I see a little thing, and then that leads me to something else, and then seven hours later, I'm still involved. I was uh, watching the attack on the Linden's Farm Monastery back by the Vikings years ago, and I just, I'm fascinated by all that, and I asked my kids earlier, I said, would I, would I make a good king, right? So we Because like with capital ministries, with those type of things, we live in a much different governing society um, and we have rights and we have things that that are bestowed upon us because we're citizens of this country. Didn't always used to be like that. When you lived under a king's rule, the king had unlimited power, could literally do anything he wanted to. And the longer he was there, the more ingrained he was in his society the more power that he had. And in just about every single instance, that can get carried away. Um, and, And when you have that much power, and that power is often unchecked, unless you're invaded by some other entity, you can do whatever you want. So I asked my kids, I'm like, would I be a good king? And the answers were kind of all over the place. They, uh, They said, well, yeah, you'd be a good king until it came time to like, where you had to kill people, and you had to, to do that. I don't know if I could do that, but I thought, I, I could get people to do that. And then they started listing, like, well, Marty or Michael or Ed, you know, they can be like the hand of the king. And I'm like, that's a great idea. I'm like, don't tell me what you do to that poor person. Just take care of that issue and let me know how it all turns out. Um, and it's something that, that we hear in Scripture quite a bit, this reference to Jesus being king, and, and there is, in 2023, there's, there's a little bit of um, vagueness as to what that means. Now, we just spent the past year walking through the Old Testament, and if you remember, I want to say this was probably February or March, we said that the God's people um, were different in that, that God was their ruler, but then they decided... We want to be like everybody else. We want a king. And in in just a few words, God kind of said, it's probably not a good idea, but I'll give that to you. And then what you see through the rest of the Old Testament is some awful kings. Even the good ones had their horrible moral failures, their downfalls. They failed time and time again. But all of them were looking down the road, waiting for Jesus, because when Jesus came, he would be the king that would set everything right. The problem is what they got was not what they expected. If you were at our Christmas Eve service, we talked about this, that, that they were expecting a Messiah that would come in on a white horse and conquer Rome, take over everything. And what they got was a baby in a manger in, in a faraway place, and, and it wasn't what they were expecting. But we also learned that when a king is born, people must choose, and that is significant. And, and that's what puts some foundation to our understanding of if Jesus is king, what does that mean to you and me? How does that affect our daily life even today? And so we're going to dive into that a little bit today. If you have your sermon notes, um, you can take that out. And we'll follow along. But it's interesting when we go through the Gospels, which I know we just spent the past year in the Old Testament. But when you go through the Gospels, what you find is that Mark um, was encouraging believers, those who were followers of Jesus, to persevere in the faith, to hang in there even when times were tough. Luke was different. Luke was a doctor. Um, writing to a guy named Theophilus, basically recounting the events of this guy, Jesus. So if he's supposed to be king, I want to know about him. I want to learn what he's about. Um, And then we get to John, 
John does the same thing, but John's main push is he wants everyone to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He basically tells us, John chapter 20, he says, I, I'm writing all of these things so that you would believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Then finally, Matthew, um, he's writing to a Jewish audience trying to prove that Jesus has a basis for being king and that he came from the line of David, which most Israelites would have said that David was the best king they ever had. He built power and actually established them as a nation. And he had his major moral downfalls, but he was probably the best that they could come up with, and it kind of all fell apart from there. Um, and then Jesus came, literally born as a baby, preached as a child, he was killed as a man, died, buried, resurrected, and he's coming back as king. So what does that mean to us? Why, why would that be important? And how does that affect our life? So going into a new year, how does that, how does that affect what we do on a daily basis? How does that affect if you're, if you're a dad? How does it affect you being the father of your household? Or if you're a mom and taking care of kids, how does that affect that? If you're single and you're looking for um, someone to spend the rest of your life with, how does Jesus being king navigate what you do and the decisions you make? And so that's kind of where we're going to jump off today. Um, and we're going to start with this first question. How do we know that he's king, right? I mean, I tell you time and time again, just because I say it, um, that I think it's somewhat important. But when, when you're in a tough situation and your life is falling apart and you lost your job or you're out of money or you're in the hospital and life is just really falling apart, just because Greg said something doesn't mean much in those instances. We want to know what does the Word of God say? What does the Bible say about it? Because that gives us more strength to our faith. So how do we know that Jesus is King? So we're going to go through some of these kind of quick. Um, we'll explain a little bit more. But the first one is this. Here's one of the ways we know is that he was from the line of David. That's what Matthew goes to great lengths in last... Uh, Last week, I guess, the Sunday morning Christmas service. I don't know about you, but, but this week between Christmas and New Year's is kind of like the dark ages. I'm not even sure what day it is. Um, and I had the worst Christmas hangover I've ever had. And I didn't drink anything. I just, I just you know, 100 miles an hour getting to Christmas and then Christmas and then nothing. And then we took a couple of days off, and there were days I'd wake up, and I'm like, I'm not going to look at my phone. I'm just going to try to guess what day it is, like Wednesday, Thursday. I'm not really sure. Um, but that's, uh, that's how we, we tie this all together when, when we're trying to decide he's from the line of David. So I think it was that Sunday morning we said Matthew literally walks through the lineage of Jesus and says he's from the line of David. Um, Matthew 9, 27, for example, and there's so many of these. I just picked one, but there's about eight different references just in Matthew. But he says, and as Jesus passed from there, two blind men followed him crying aloud. And they said, have mercy on us, son of David. And so there began to be a spillover that people would say, this is the king that came from the line of David. Matthew 15 and Matthew 20, um, another instance where they said, you are the son of David. Matthew 21, where he's going into Jerusalem. They're laying down palm branches, and they would say, Hosanna to the son of David. So there was an understanding that he was king because he was of the line of David. Here's the next one. He was foretold by the prophets throughout the Old Testament. Now, this, I would love to camp out right here, but we don't have a ton of time. Over 300 and some odd references of the Old Testament pointing to Jesus and how it's all going to flesh out, that he's going to be born in Bethlehem and that all of these things that, that, that were foretold long before Jesus was born that actually came true. And, and the chances, I've seen so many different illustrations about this, but it's mind-boggling how 
just a couple of these prophecies could actually happen. Um, but when you start talking about 300 of them and Jesus fulfilled all of them, if you're making up the Bible, which is, you know, an argument that a lot of people have, that, that it was made up by church people to control people, um, those are some of the things you can't do. You can't take you can't take Old Testament literature. You can't take writings that happened 1,500, 2,000 years ago and <clears throat> make them make sense in, in the future, which at this point was the present, as they're writing these things to be fulfilled. You just can't do that. So if you're one of those people that would say, yeah, I don't believe a lot about the Bible. I think it may have been made up. That's one of the things you need to wrestle with. How did he fulfill all of these prophecies and Jesus fulfilled every one of them. Um, David affirmed him as king. The wise men affirmed him as king. New Testament writers, Old Testament writers, prophets basically said that Jesus was the king. But here's the bigger point of why or how we know that Jesus is king. He was approved by God. He had his stamp of approval from God the Father himself. And if God says it, um, you, you've seen this maybe on a T-shirt or a bookmark. It says, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. And then over time, that's been changed to God said it, that settles it. Like, it doesn't matter if you believe it or not. But God literally said, this is my beloved son. <clears throat> As Jesus is being baptized, Matthew is kind of going to great lengths to describe what happened and, and he's trying to use words the best that he can. And what he basically said is, you know, it's John the Baptist and Jesus. They're in the water. They're going to baptize him. He says, and then I saw the Spirit of God coming down out of heaven like, and I think Matthew may be kind of grasping for words, like, like kind of like a dove. Like it wasn't like a parrot landing on his shoulder, but, but it was, it was uh, that's what I see in my mind. And Miss um, Nicholson, my third grade Sunday school teacher with her felt board, you know, she'd have Jesus and John the Baptist standing, and then she'd pull like a bird out of her little apron and put it on the shoulder of Jesus. And so in my mind, when I see that, I'm like, he's had a bird on his shoulder like a pirate. That's probably not what it was. Probably Matthew saying the Spirit of God came down, and it was, I don't know, it was kind of, kind of like a dove. And then we heard a voice from heaven that said, and this is the verse, it says, And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. That they, that they heard that. It was God's stamp of approval. You know this because we talk about it. I'm going to write the King Greg version of the Bible. I just need Chuck to cough up some money so that I can afford to do it. But when, when he does, when God finally changes his heart and does it, um, in, in the King Greg version, it's going to say, and behold, a voice from heaven said, that's my boy. That's him. That is my son. If you, if you have children, you know there are times where probably wouldn't spit on them if they were on fire. But then there are other times where you look at him and you're just like, wow, they, they just... And I've had this happen with every single one of my kids multiple times where I just sit back and, and there's a pride that wells up as a father where you just say, that, that's my boy. That's, that's what I raised. That's what I created. That's how I wanted it to be. And I think this verse does that. It's God saying, that's my boy. That's, that's the one that I give my stamp of approval on and literally was approved by God. In the Old Testament, and you know this if you've been with us last year, all of the Old Testament prophets and kings failed. Jesus was the only one that fulfilled all of those things that God called him to do. So if he is king, and the Bible points us to the fact that he is, how does Jesus demonstrate that? Right? Because that's where the rubber meets the road. Um, when I was thinking if I would be a good king or not, once you become king, how does that play out? Do you rule by fear? Do you rule by love? Do you rule by grace? Do you rule by power? How does it happen? And we know in the Old Testament and throughout history, and we use this term a lot, that might made right. Meaning, if you had power, 
then it was right. You could do whatever you wanted to do. Well, maybe you would rule like that if you were a king, or maybe you wouldn't. But Jesus demonstrates how he was king much different than what most kings have done. And I think that's what separates him. Here's a couple of things that I was thinking about. He loves the unlikely. He loves the unlikely in church life. Um, we call those EGR people, extra grace required, right? That there are people that just, they're hard to love. And now that we're past Christmas, we can, uh, can kind of take a breath and say, um, that was tough because you have family members that come um, into your house and, and some of them you, you love, all of them hopefully, but you don't like some of them. And so it's hard to get through and they're just not lovable people. Have you ever, like maybe someone at work or someone that is in your neighborhood and they're just, they're just hard to love. There are some people that are easy to love, but some people that are just, they're just hard to love. Jesus demonstrates his kingship by loving those who are extremely hard to love, who are difficult. And that's one of the things that sets him apart. Now, you would have expected when Jesus was born to start his ministry in Jerusalem, right? Because that's the, the kind of the Jewish capital, but he doesn't. He starts it in a faraway place. Matthew 4 says that he starts it in Galilee, um, and he begins to develop people to follow him. Um, and the first couple of people that he picked up were some fishermen. And he, he did um, a miracle for them. And they saw the miracle and they ended up following him. And then he's trying to build disciples. This is cool because in the, the first century, Jesus wasn't the first person to have disciples. Um, if you were a rabbi, you would um, gather around people that would follow you, that would listen to your teachings. And that's what Jesus did as he began to pick. But then he comes up on this guy named Levi, and in some way, somehow, Jesus says, I know what we'll do. If we're trying to find people to follow me and to help spread this news that Jesus is teaching, let's go find, like, the worst IRS agent we can find. Let's like find the auditor that's like the worst and crooked and awful. And then Levi, who we know as Matthew, shows up and Jesus is like, that's the one. And you know, the disciples were like, brother, if you're trying to build a, a group of people that are going to follow you, let's not start with people that the world already hates. Let's not start with the unlikely. Let's start with the people that is easy to love. But not Jesus. In his kingship, he loves those who are difficult to love. And for you and I, that's, that's phenomenal news. Matthew 9, 13, he says, talking to the Pharisees, he says, go and learn what this means. He says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. And so that's what he did. We also said a couple weeks ago that it wasn't that Jesus was hanging out with sinners. It was that sinners were hanging out with Jesus because they wanted to be a part of that. And that's how his kingship started, by him loving those who really weren't lovable. Now, for you and I, this is great news when you understand that. Because all of the people, the, and I would say men, but I know there's women too, that, that come to the Rock Church and you listen to the messages and you think, if I was like these other church people, this would make some sense, or, or God may have written this verse for those people because they're good. Um, we get that all wrong. Because Jesus would say, I came for you. I came for the most broken because that's who I came. I didn't come for the righteous. That's why I wonder if Jesus were alive today, um, I wonder what type of reaction he would get. You can just imagine what would happen on X or Twitter or whatever we call it now. The, the people just bashing Jesus for maybe not spending all of his time hanging out with church people, but hanging out with those who need it. And that was his ministry. That's how it's shaped. No matter what you have done in your past, you can't outrun the love and the grace of God. 
And right now, there are people here that's like, yeah, that's good for the church people, but you don't know what I've done. If that's you, we just spent a year talking about people in the Old Testament that God used. Those that lived a really right and righteous life, you could probably count on one hand. The rest of them were absolute train wrecks. And so it points us to right there that Jesus is doing something different, and that's great news for you and for me that he loves the unlikely. Here's the next thing that he does. He conquers the uncontrollable. He conquers those who normally or previously couldn't be controlled, that that seemed like they were without hope. So he begins his ministry in Matthew, for instance, like in chapter 4, and in chapter 8, We start the work of Jesus. He cleans a leper. He heals Peter's mother-in-law. And you begin to see that, that what he's doing is he's enacting miracles on people who really need it. Those people were totally broken. He calms a storm. He heals a paralytic. He heals a blood disease. (laughs) Matthew chapter 9 um, starting around verse 20 or 24, he, he brings a dead girl back to life and then tells everyone not to talk about it. Um, and then we know that Jesus brought Lazarus back to life. This is kind of a theme. I think it's ultimately what set the ball in motion for the church to kill him was that he kept bringing people back to life. Like Jesus didn't do well at funerals. Jesus shows up and it's over. You're like, do we still eat Nancy's snacks that she prepared? Or, I mean, it, it's just, it's done. Uh, because that's what he does. He conquers the uncontrollable. You can't make this stuff up. And, and so if you're going to prove that you're king and you're going to demonstrate what it means to be a king and you love those people that are broken, you love the unlikely, and then you do things that no one else has been willing to do. Casting out demons, healing people who are totally broken and conquering the uncontrollable. Uh, Matthew chapter 9, here's what, how Matthew kind of relays it. He says, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. And look at this last part. And healing every disease and every affliction, one right after the other. Because he had the power of God to do that. How does, de- get, uh, how does Jesus demonstrate that he's king? Well, he loves those who are unlovable. It's normally not what kings do. He conquers those who everyone else has cast out. That's another thing that kings normally don't do. Here's the third one. He serves the undeserving. Think about that. He serves those who don't deserve it. Um, If you've been in church life for a while, you know that there's this term we use called servant leadership, meaning if you want to lead people, you serve them, you serve alongside of them. That's a new thought. That's a new way that it was coined. It didn't used to be like that. You didn't see kings serving other people. It was just the opposite. People would serve the king. But how does Jesus demonstrate his his kingship? He starts serving those by himself. And here's what's crazy. He started serving the people that didn't even deserve to be served. Right? You and I, we can we can serve people that we like. And and it's easy to do that. But think about the people group or or the organization or those that you just you can't stand, and if they fell off the face of the earth, you wouldn't lose a night's sleep over it. You may even throw a party. Those are the people that Jesus came to serve is those who were so far from God. And that's how he demonstrates himself as a king. He literally says, I'm going to serve those who don't um, deserve it. There, this, this whole passage is is amazing. I took just a couple of, of, uh, of verses from it, but he said, the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Now, uh, we talk about this frequently, but when we see Pharisees, we go, oh, those nasty Pharisees. You know what they were? They were church people. They, they were the church. 
And so the Pharisees went out and conspired against him, and they thought, we got to get rid of this guy. Look at the next verse. Jesus, being aware of this, withdrew from there, and many followed him, and he healed them all. Jesus knew this was going to happen, knew that the church was going to turn on him, but yet he continued to serve. He continued to love. He continued to conquer those who were unconquerable, those who didn't deserve it at all is how Jesus literally demonstrated himself um, as king. Now, uh, Matthew 13, if you want to read that chapter when you get home, it's an interesting passage that he goes to his hometown to preach, and they try to kill him. Luckily, he slips away, but it was so bad that even with him preaching in his own hometown where everyone knew him, it didn't go the way he thought it would go. Um, and he still served those who rejected him. Remember, we were talking about um, the disciples. And this is, again, if you're making up the Bible, you're not going to include this part. But head into Jerusalem. They have to go through this city called Samaria. And they won't let Jesus and the disciples stay there. And the disciples were like, I got an idea. Can we call down fire from heaven and kill them all? And Jesus is like, really? That, that's what you want to do? What you've seen for me has never been like that. And what happens is Jesus actually goes to the cross and dies for those people who had turned their back on him. I think about that all, all the time, that God would send his son to die knowing that people would still reject him. And he did it anyway. You don't see that with kings. That's not something that kings do, but that's how Jesus lived his life. So what does he promise as king? So if, if when a king is born, people must choose, and therefore you have a choice to make, what does Jesus promise you? If you make Jesus your king, what is promised? What do we get out of it? This should never be a question that we ask, but let's be honest, we do. What do I get from it? What, how does it benefit me personally that Jesus is king? What does he promise us um, throughout his life? And, and some of these are interesting because we see them throughout Scripture. The first promise, he says, is that his life will be taken, which should make you go, what? Like you're the king. How in the world is that going to happen? And I struggled with this. His life will be taken because, yes, it was, but it was willingly given. It wasn't like they took his life and he was defenseless. He literally allowed it to happen and gave his life to be your sacrifice and to be my sacrifice. Uh, verse Matthew 16, 21 says that from that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. So he must go to Jerusalem, suffer under the church leadership, and that they're ultimately going to kill him. That was one of the things that Jesus promised. Here's where I, um, where I think the disciples... If they didn't know or if they were confused or maybe it was all happening so fast, if you have just given everything to follow this Messiah, right? Um, you've left family, you've left jobs, and now you're following this rabbi and, and giving your life for it. And then he says, oh, by the way, they're going to kill me. Wouldn't you think they would have questioned that and been like, well, then why are we following you? Why, why does that make sense? If you're going to follow someone, let's not be the guy we're going to follow that's going to get killed. Why? Because if you haven't thought about it, you probably should. If you're following the guy and they kill the guy you're following, they're going to have no problem killing you. And so as this is going through their mind, and I don't know if they're processing this, I don't know if they thought it would be that bad, we do know that the disciples didn't understand some of the things that Jesus taught. Like Jesus would be teaching parables, and you could almost kind of see it play out, but 
He's standing up there. Maybe his disciples are up there with him, or maybe they're in the crowd. He's teaching, and he decides to use a parable. A parable is just a way to take something that they did every day, relate it to everyday life, and that would explain the teaching. And, and he would teach this, and the people would hear it, and the disciples would be up there shaking their heads like, yeah. And then one of them would look at the other and go, what in the world is he talking about? And the disciples was like, I have no earthly idea. And then in the Bible, we find they go up to Jesus, and they're like, Jesus. That sermon, it was amazing. Top 10. What in the world did it mean? I have no idea where you were going. And Jesus was like, really? Have you not been with me that long that you don't know these things? They're like, no. We have no earthly idea. So maybe they didn't know this. Maybe no one questioned and said, so you're going to be killed? Like, but we're still going to follow you? He's like, yeah, um, I've got to go to Jerusalem. And when I get there, I'm going to suffer and they're going to kill me. Okay, which one of you, if you were a disciple, wouldn't say, then let's don't go to Jerusalem? <laughs> I mean, I, maybe that's a news flash, but let's don't. Let's go somewhere else if that's what's going to happen. But in that promise that his life would be taken, he also promises that his death would be temporary. And I don't think they understood this either because you see what happens after the cross leads me to believe that they didn't understand this. So let's go back to that same verse, uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, and let's look at how he finishes it. He says, I got to go to Jerusalem, suffer under the elders, scribes, priests, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. So Jesus is saying, they're going to kill me, but I'm going to come back to life. And when we dig into Scripture, we have to think that they either didn't believe it or didn't know what he was talking about, or maybe they didn't hear it, but they didn't get this. That's why when Jesus is being crucified, they all fled. If they would have believed this, they probably would have thrown a party after the crucifixion, and they'd been like, this is going to be great. Just wait, because three days from now, he's coming back to life. So let's just throw a party. No, they ran and hid. They were scared for their own life. So maybe they didn't believe it, but one of his promises was not only would his life be taken, but that his death was going to be temporary because he's coming back to life. This is one of those things that is the cornerstone of what we believe about not just Jesus being king, but Jesus being your savior is that he conquered death. Paul, one of the writers of the most of the, the New Testament, the second half of the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, if the resurrection didn't happen, then we're all fools. We should be pitied among men because everything based on the resurrection you and I both know that Jesus has caused quite a stir throughout history. Governments have tried to kill him. Um, they've, they've tried to make it to where you can't teach about Jesus. And then people just do the craziest things because they believe it. You may be one of those people that think, yeah, but how do we know that he rose from the dead? Well, well think about this. The most powerful religion in the world the, re the one religion that has changed the face of the globe, even changed the face of Rome, if you wanted to end that religion, it would be simple. You go to the tomb, you exhume the body of Jesus, you put it on a cart, you wheel it through the streets of Jerusalem right up to the temple gates, and you end Christianity that day but they weren't able to do that because there is no body. You say, well, the disciples took it. These scared disciples would take it from the Roman guards that were protecting it. This is one of those things, if you're kind of a skeptic and you're like, yeah, I don't know that I buy into it. It's one of those things that make you scratch your head and go, maybe there's something to that. Because he said, my life will be taken, but my death will be temporary. Um, Think about other religions. 
Okay, all, all of the ones that are kind of, I don't want to say mainline, but all of those ones that you hear about quite a bit. Um, Buddha, Confucius, Mohammed, all of those people. You know what they all have in common? They're all dead. And you know what happened when they died? They stayed dead. They did what the rest of us do. Now, some of you aren't going to understand this, but some of you, I'm sure Michael and some of us others, we understand this really well. Um, if you're going to cheat off someone, cheat off the smart people. Here, here's, here's what happened in high school. I never had anybody cheat off me, ever. <laughs> like, some of you, like, you're taking tests and you don't want anyone to see what you're writing. That wasn't me. I got to hold up my paper and everybody be like, yeah, we don't want to know what you're writing down. Um, it almost got as bad, not that I was cheating, but... Um, especially since this is online, I don't want to lose my degrees. But I would sit by the really smart people. And so I would go into campus. Um, at this time, it was either at Southwestern or at the University of Oklahoma. And I'd walk in. I'd look for the people that just look smart. Right? You know who they are. Some people are like, you're smart. You're not so smart, right? <laughs> I love Ed to death. I probably wouldn't sit by Ed in a class. <laughs> I mean, come on. You're, you're with me, right? Ed knows it. He's like, Carolyn's like, amen. I would say by Carolyn. <laughs> because if you're going to cheat and you want that information, you're going to do it from those who have passed the test. Got an A plus on it. But yet, Buddha, Confucius, and Mohammed, and Joseph Smith, and all these, they failed the test. You want to know what happens after you die? Then, then you have to know for sure who would I follow that has actually passed that part of the test. I had just recently two friends um, just die kind of tragically of, of, in this instance, they were cardiac issues. And, and so what happens after death is, is always on people's minds. I wonder what it's going to be like. Well, if you're going to choose someone to follow, if you're going to choose someone to study, choose the one that passed it. Jesus Christ, when it came to the, the test of death, A++, plus plus, he nailed it. So why wouldn't you follow him? This is the one thing about other religions that I can't wrap my mind around. I want you to view your relationship with Christ as something you sell out for. But if you're going to do it, do it with the right person. Do it with the one that passed, not with those who died just like you're going to, and they're still dead to this day because Jesus promised it would be temporary, and that's who we follow. Here's the, the next one he promises, that his victory will be timeless, that when he comes back to life, it will last forever. We're all looking forward to this, it's also from Matthew. Then, talking about Jesus, will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all of the tribes of earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So there's coming a time when Jesus will return. He's coming back. We don't know when. We don't necessarily know how, although we can kind of draw some information from the Bible. But this is truly the return of the king, the one king coming back to life because that's what Jesus promises as king. Everything else that we've talked about shouldn't, if it doesn't matter to you, that's okay. This should matter to you, that his victory will be for eternity. That following Jesus means that there is an eternal life that is available for you. Why would you not accept it? So if that's the case, how do we respond? And this is kind of obvious, but, but I wanted to make sure we talk through this. You have two responses to Jesus being king. So if he is king, and here's how he demonstrated himself, here's the first thing you can do. You can reject Jesus as king. You have that right. And this is where kingship differs with Jesus than it does any other kingdom. If you reject a king that is king over your land, they took your head off. 
Not so with Jesus. You can choose to reject him. You can choose to take all of this information and go, yeah, um, I don't care. I don't believe. I don't want any part of that. That's the one thing that I don't understand. If that's you today and in the back of your mind, you're thinking, yeah, that's kind of where I am. I just don't know what makes sense. Do, do me a favor on this card, um, maybe on the back or somewhere, right? You know, call me, text me, email me something. We'll keep it secret. We won't tell anyone because I want to I want to be able to sit down with you and say, why? It's definitely an option, but why would you reject Jesus as king? With all the evidence that has been given, even if a, a minute part of it is true, it should change everything. It should change what you believe. It should change your life as a whole. You can reject him. Here's a scary verse. Pastor Michael will tell you the same thing keeps pastors up at night to read when Matthew says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. There are those who, who in this instance, and this is how they kind of explained it, Matthew said that they gather all the fish from the nets and they separate the good fish um, from those that are not fish at the end of time, and that's how they know who are followers of Jesus and who aren't. But the problem's going to be there's obviously those when you cast out a big net there's obviously those that you bring in car tires and license plates and that kind of stuff they're nowhere close to to god and and that's easy the problem are going to be like the other things that aren't really fish but they look like fish and they act like fish and they talk like fish and they would fit perfectly in our churches but they've never accepted jesus as king. And I think this is what Matthew is saying. When Jesus relayed this, he says, not everyone who calls to me and says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Because they have chosen to reject Jesus as king. Or the next suggestion, you can follow Jesus as king. It's a free gift that will cost you everything. Giving your life to Jesus to follow him. Uh, Matthew 4.18 says, immediately they left their nets and followed Jesus. A few verses later, James and John left their dad in the boat to go follow Jesus. And following means that we just surrender everything. Not that we just surrender Sunday mornings at 10.30. But because Jesus is king, it affects my job, it affects my family, it affects my free time, it affects every single thing that I do. And it doesn't mean quit your job and follow Jesus. This is where we kind of get off the rails. It doesn't mean quit your job and follow Jesus. It means use your job to glorify God. So when you go back to work in a couple days and you walk in, I'd love for you to think, how can I use this job to glorify God. How, how can I use this to bring glory and honor to his name? Matthew 10, it's a hard teaching. He says, anyone that loves his father and mother and children and siblings and loves all them more than he loves Jesus um, is not worthy of Jesus. But that doesn't mean leave your family. You know what that means? That means glorify God through your family. It's, it's why we talk about in our, our house quite a bit, and Patty and I talked about it, raising our kids, that the Paytons exist to glorify the name of Jesus and advance his kingdom. Are we perfect at it? No. You've heard the stories. We, we mess it up all the time. We don't leave our families, but we use our families to glorify this person that we have called king and we have decided to follow. If you're a father, lead your family in that way. I would encourage you to do that. Some of you are in a situation where maybe your husband or someone isn't a follower of Jesus, and so it might be much harder for you than you, you glorify God by yourself in that family because that's what following a king means, a radical abandonment of everything that we have known. Why? Because Jesus is king. I heard this and I loved it. It says that all kings in history sent their people to die for them. 
and wars and all kinds of things, all these kings sent their own people in their own kingdom to die for them. Jesus was the only king who chose to die for his own people. And through his death, we have life. Listen, if you're going to follow a king, why not that one? Why not one that says, I'm going to give my life so that you can have abundant life? Granted, it doesn't make sense, but that's who I'm going to follow. That's what I want for us as a church. That's what I want for us as a faith family is to follow the one that promises eternal life. And Jesus, in a way, chose you to follow him. And he didn't pick you because of what you could offer him. He picked you because of what he could offer you. He said, I could give you so much if you would just allow me to be king and Lord of your life. And that's how he lived his entire life, and that's how we will spend eternity. We have nothing to bring to the table, right? I don't have anything that we can bring that would make Jesus um, better than he already is. I have nothing to bring to him. You, you would not like Greg Payton void of Jesus Christ. You wouldn't. But only by the grace of Jesus can I stand before God right and holy. So I've chosen in my life, I want to make Jesus king. And listen, um, I, I mess up quite a bit with that. But I try again the next day. I think that's why the Bible says his mercies are new every morning. So you're not going to get it perfect, but have you chosen to make Jesus king? And if not, why not? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes with me just for a minute. I want to ask, what, what would this next year look like? What would 2024 look like if we all decided to, to, to bend the knee, to give all of our praise and worship, to give everything that we have to Jesus as our king? What would change? I can tell you what would change for the better. Your family, your job things that you do for fun, the, the life that you live. But it's a conscious decision to say, I'm going to follow Jesus and make him the king and the Lord of my life. There are many of you in here that have done that. There are probably also those in here that have never done that. And the Bible makes it so simple that even a guy like me can understand it. Literally says, believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and that God has raised him from the dead and you will be saved. Saved from what? Saved from death? No. Saved from having to face the wrath of God alone. Believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. Right where you are today, you can ask God to forgive you of your sins, to allow your heart to be turned over to Jesus to worship him as your king. The Bible says that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You don't have to be good. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be right. You don't even have to know. You're still looking for the book of Matthew. You don't even know anything about this. God says there's nothing that you have done that can out sin the cross that Jesus sacrificed himself on for us no greater decision you could make going into a new year than to say this year I'm living for the king and his name is Jesus so I'm going to pray out loud and while you're wrestling with this if, if you're trying to make this decision I want to ask that you pray to your heavenly father pray whatever you need to, to be as graphic as you need to, to ask God or to, to pray for something that maybe you've never prayed for before. That God would give you the strength to follow him in fullness and abandon everything else for his glory. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the love and the grace and the mercy that you've given us. God, we pray today that 
those who don't know you as Lord and Savior, who have never given you that place as king over our lives, that today would be a day of salvation. We wouldn't chance living another day without giving you that rightful place. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for giving us grace, even though we don't deserve it. Thank you for giving us a pathway to eternity that means total fellowship with you. And I pray there's not a single person that's ever been here at this this faith family gathering, that's ever heard the words of Scripture, would ever get to the end of their life and just never chose to follow you as king. We pray for salvation. We pray for the grace that you've given us to follow you all the days of our lives. And God, when we mess up, when we blow it, when it didn't look like we were following you on this particular day, may tomorrow be a new day where we follow you as the king of our lives. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.